Previously on the Jay and Dan podcast. Mm-hmm. Dave Naylor is actually infamous for uh, bringing mustard to Michael Landsberg's house for a Super Bowl party and then taking the mustard home with him. Mm-hmm. This guy's like, no, I'm bringing my own imported mustard from Cleveland, of all places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this guy's a kook. This guy should be locked up. Mm-hmm. Stores can't survive on nostalgia alone. When was the last time you were there? Like, I alone could have kept Sears in business. Well, well I mean, you could have contributed. Mm-hmm. Every Sears in Canada closed. Was I supposed to go Sears to Sears? Mm-hmm. A picture of Mother Teresa <laughs> washing someone's washing feet. Washing someone's feet. She's taking some foot washer's job. Mm-hmm. My dishwasher started leaking. The outlet in my bathroom stopped working out of nowhere. <laughs> Clear the leaves and twigs in my <laughs> eaves trough. Mm-hmm. Dan is yeah. dying over here. Dan, you just had a coughing fit, but then something came out of your body. It was a partial vomit. You puked on the pot. It's mm-hmm. been a few weeks since he's been on. Nice. Not really. Oh. Hey, ooh. <laughs> You're listening to the Jay and Dan podcast. Brought to you by our friends at McDonald's. The uh, acid reflux is flexing. That was very funny. Man, I, stop. You you outdo yourself on a week-to-week basis here. Just before this, an hour before I left my home, <laughs> I'm here for this podcast, I thought it's bye-bye Toolsy. I was watching the, the race, and uh, all of a sudden, couldn't breathe. The acid reflux had clogged my throat. Ooh, not good. Old man toolsy. Yeah. But I made it. The vertigo, the acid reflux, the coughing, the vomiting, the spontaneous vomiting. That's the worst part. You have no control over it. Nah. Um, yeah, is it time to start thinking about maybe taking better care of yourself? Or... I, I'm eating the healthiest and doing the most working out I've ever done in my life. Makes no sense. I think I need assisted living. Gosh, that would be great, wouldn't it? Oh, man. Oh, it would be lovely to have just someone tuck you into bed every night and get you out of bed every morning, carry you to the shower, and and if you, if bathe you, you, soap you down. If you don't want to, change your diaper. Right, right. If you right. don't want to do it. Or if you want to poop, like just sit there while you poop and talk, which is what I have to do with my daughter every night. <laughs> every night she poops and I have to sit and talk to her about it. We're talking poop, talk. Well, we play games and stuff. We play headbands um, while she's pooping. <laughs> and like you can hear her pooping. She's like, Daddy, that was a poop. I was like, yeah, I can hear that. Yeah. yeah. I can Daddy can hear. I can hear what you're doing there. And I can smell it. too. That's my life now. Hey, uh, guys. Yeah. I'm usually out of the loop, but uh, I just watched it. two big movies over the weekend. You ready for a review? Joker. Eh. That's it? Yeah. Eh. Oh, okay. It gets an eh from me. Okay. And Parasite, really good. Yeah, everyone loves Parasite. <laughs> Not Parasites, just Parasite, just the one. Um, yeah, it, I didn't know what was going to happen from one moment to the next. I will not go any further because I will give something away. Yeah, like producer Tim. The king of spoilers. <laughs> you ran. I've never seen you move so quick produ- as you did yesterday. Producer Tim, because I haven't seen anything. Producer Tim, I mean, I haven't <laughs> seen a movie in probably seven years. I haven't seen a movie probably since Back to the Future in 1985. <laughs> I haven't seen a movie since then. So I'll set it up. So I said, hey, Tim, he's the big movie buff. Tim's I've seen everything. Tim saw all the Best Picture nominees. And he said... I said, I saw Parasite, and he said, what'd you think? And I said, yeah, I really liked it. And then he started, one word in, you're like, I'm out of here! Because he always gets into specifics. <laughs> and he's like, well, that has nothing to do with the plot. And I was like, it doesn't matter. Everything is a spoiler. You want to go in fresh. Now, there is, I agree with this sort of like, the rule, like, if it's been on, on demand, or it's, if it's on Crave, then at that point, you'll have only yourself to blame. But 
Tim thinks it has nothing to do, but he'll come in and say, like, yeah, Spider-Man died. Yes. Nothing to do with the movie. Right, like, right. The whole, that doesn't change the plot. Everyone knows. So here's what happens. <laughs> Iron Man and Captain America f and then they die in each other's arms. Well, Tim, that's the, that's the f climax, literally, of Avengers. Okay, Shawshank Redemption. In the end, they both get out. Everyone knew that. Everybody knew it already. That's Tim. <laughs> I want him to break down the new Vin Diesel movie, Bloodshot. You're obsessed with this movie. I'm obsessed with... Although I don't watch Vin Diesel movies, I'm obsessed with the trailers for them, and I'm obsessed with Nick Cage movies, which we've discussed. And I noticed something... Um, do we have that stuff? Uh, something from the new Bloodshot Vin Diesel movie. He says one line specifically that I think our audience will enjoy. Where are you going? I've got unfinished business. I'm the man who murdered my wife. <laughs> my wife. My wife. My wife. I will say this. My wife loves Vin Diesel movies if they're Fast and the Furious movies. My wife. She really does. She loves Fast and the Furious movies. She'll go see all of them in their, the theaters with her friends. And they'll clap. They were a hit. Oh, they're gigantic. The new one, Fast 9, or F9, or whatever the hell it's called. I just saw the trailer for that, and uh, John Cena is the bad guy in it now. No Vin Diesel. No, he's, oh, wow. he's the star, <laughs> but John Cena's in it as his brother, not his wife. Okay. My wife. <laughs> um, so the premise of uh, Bloodshot is he gets killed, he's a soldier, and they bring him back, and um, his body can repair itself, so he gets shot, it's just like, whatever, he gets cut. Kind of like the Terminator. Yeah, fixes itself. Yeah. So basically, they stole the plot of the Terminator. Yeah, or and Million Dollar Man, a bit of that in there, right? Because he could repair himself. The Six Million Dollar Man, million. weren't they? <laughs> Sorry, I, I took five million off. <laughs> <laughs> that was in the 40s. <laughs> the Million Dollar Man! One million dollars. We will build this man. Hey, does Vin Diesel stu do, still do the uh, talk show circuit? Because there was those clips going around where he repeats the same thing from talk show to talk show, like word for word. That's a great uh, question. I, I haven't seen him on one for a long time. Does he have a sense of humor about himself? Now, no. remember, The Rock and Vin Diesel dislike each other so much. Or, or The Rock thought Vin Diesel was so disrespectful of the crew of Fast and the Furious that they basically have spun The Rock off in these Hobbs and Shaw movies because they, they can't do movies together anymore. And they were like, who's another wrestler we can get? John Cena. Boom. Now he's the bad guy. Every time I hear Hobbs and Shaw, I think that's a cartoon. It sounds cartoony, doesn't it? It sounds like something that should be on Nick Jr. in the afternoon. Bingo and boingo. It's The Rock. Bingo and Boingo, Jason Statham as Boingo, <laughs> and The Rock as Bingo. This summer, B5, Bingo, and Boingo. Way more bongo. It's going to be good. Uh, the outside, what's it called? Bloodshots? Bloodshot. Um, I'll be good. Now, this uh, Friday, we have a big outing. A uh, huge outing. It's the three of us. It's our first get-together since our tour. Since the craft, <laughs> not the craft tour. The Jane and podcast. Right. Tour. We are going to see another podcaster who's a stand-up comedian. Producer Tim pointed out that uh, he was on Road Rules and, and uh, all those shows. Theo Vaughn, he was on Road Rules. Back he was like on The, the Challenge. Yeah, it was like a big part of it. Tim said, that's how I knew him. Again, why was Tim watching Road Rules? <laughs> what is Tim doing? Anyway, we love Theo's podcast. We pointed it out last week when we had uh, Mark Norman, when we had Mark on. And uh, yeah, we, we discovered Mark through Theo's podcast. We love Theo's podcast. So we're going to see him live uh, on stage. The Rat King. This Friday. Gang, gang. Yeah, it's going to be fun. So we're... Um I was going to ask you guys, we can go for dinner before? I like to get a little meal on. I, uh... No, uh, that's a no. I would like to go for dinner after. Dinner Ooh. after. Maybe hung hung. Well, you eat before, maybe have a McDonald's Big Mac, and then after you have a big meal. You just get stuffed, and then you go right to bed. But 
we would be eating till like pork. we would be eating till like eleven. That's right. No one's o- no nowhere's open. Like the Spaniards. Okay, I'm fine with that. Like the Spanish people. Tools, are you gonna stay in Toronto? You gonna make a, a a night out of it? Well, seeing as we won't be wrapping up till three a.m. Yes. Why would you go home after that? Stuff. Fine. You want a what little, are you going to do, Stop? You want a little nibble before, too? Yeah, I think I could go for something oh. before. Yeah. Oh, okay. Double date. That's it. And then our friend Alex Kinnanis is going to come, come with us, too. Alex, hardworking TSN guy. Awesome. Blue Jays cameraman. Raptors cameraman. He's everywhere. Oh, man. He's got all the dirt. Speaking of the Jays, yeah. uh, rest in peace, Tony, Tony Fernandez. Tony Fernandez, that was sad. He was. You knew it was coming. He'd been uh, not well for a long time. Such just an elegant player, and a lot of people. I sent out a message saying I love the '85 Jays, and that's where Tony Fernandez became a regular on that team. And just the way he played, like I, whenever you were playing baseball, your friends, you'd try to emulate his swing, try to emulate how he played in the infield, and oh man, he just like it's almost like he floated on the air. It's so interesting because he was a part of the. Uh... The Fred McGriff uh, trade for Joe Carter and Roberto Alomar. So in some ways, like he was such a huge part of those those Jays teams in the 80s, such a huge part of the team. Still, most games played, most hits, most triples. Four gold gloves, five all-star appearances. But maybe his most significant contribution was being a part of that trade that got us Alomar. And then coming back and being a part of the team in 1993. And then going to the Yankees in 95 and apparently allowing the Yankees to hold up, bringing Derek Jeter up too quickly because they had Tony still fielding up a storm well well into his career. I still remember when Tony Fernandez got taken out uh, against the Tigers on a slide because of the horrible turf at uh, Exhibition Stadium and like broke his elbow. And you're like, ah, that's, that's it for the Jays' chances. But uh, Tony Fernandez, one of the greats um, in that lineup with the... So he had a very unique stance in my most favorite Jay stance of all time. Still, Garth Orch. No one will ever top that. Um, We're getting close to the baseball season. Um, This Astros stuff this week. Oh, my God, what an embarrassment that was. Yeah, they were just... uh, Yeah, they've been talking about it all week. Now Carlos Correa is uh, coming back at Cody Bellinger. Cody Bellinger said that uh, that Altuve stole Aaron Judge's MVP in Correct. 2017, and so now Correa is coming back and defending uh, Altuve's boy. Bottom line is, because they never punished any of the players, this is going to be a problem all year. But I really do think that the whole they're not going to be throwing at him constantly because they're just they're going to get suspended left and right. The first guy to throw at him is going to get suspended like 25 games. And then it's going to stop. And then everyone's going to revolt. They're going to like, "Well, why is he getting a suspension?" And then but they're just going to stop playing and not get paid? Do does every pitcher just throw at them though and they just keep going until there's no nobody left? That makes no sense. I know, but they they have gotten together at some point players are talking to figure out what they're going to do for sure i don't know maybe cuz you have to I have don't think one of they those can moments. do anything they can't do anything they've already said like like someone will do something cuz someone will be stupid enough to do something but they'll come down on them they will and also let's not try to pretend like the Houston Astros are the only team to steal signs in the last 5 years in major league baseball yeah, because they're probably one of twenty-five teams doing it. But they were known because um, we talked to baseball people, um, and they were known before this as just a bunch so of jerks. Are, are we gonna are we gonna punish all the Red Sox when the Red Sox stuff comes out? Yeah, we're we gonna throw at them too. Exactly. So everyone's just gonna be throwing at the Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's poorly handled by by Rob Manfred in the sense that uh, you know. I just, I, I, I have to admit, I, I didn't think this was as big of a deal as everyone else does because I just assume everyone's stealing signs. Everyone. They just had a more elaborate system. And they won the World Series. 
Did you see what Altuve did today? Supposedly he walked by a bunch of reporters and took his shirt off and showed them a tattoo. Uh, like, there it is. Huh? It's gotten to that awkward point where they don't know what they're thinking. Oh, can we joke about this now? No, too soon. Yeah. Can't joke about it. But Correa, he's like, well, see, and someone brought this up like, they think because they faced the media that one first day of spring training, all the Astros, and it was so awkward, every answer was so awkward. And they think because they did that, now nobody can say anything. Yeah. Right? So now when Bellinger comes out and says something, Mike Trout came out and said something on Sunday about how they're all cheaters. And now the Astros are getting their backs up. Like, well, we admitted it. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, it still, it doesn't mean it's over. It doesn't so, mean they're going to instantly forgive you guys. So baseball, you can cheat. Football, you can cheat by uh, stealing signs and all that there, too. Could you cheat in hockey? No, you have to get more specific. Is there anything on ice where you could cheat and later get... Because like, you can't tip shots. Well, you can literally tip shots. But I mean, I guess, it, yeah. You it, can't tell uh, the goalie shot come in and buzz them. Because oh, they, yeah, maybe if you're pretty bad goalie if he didn't know. Yeah, co-conspirators. It's like a Pete Rose thing. If you're a goalie just letting in a bunch of goals, you're just a, you have a gambling problem. <laughs> that would be wild, though, if a goalie for like three games in a row let in like 30 goals total. Turned out he'd bet against himself. I mean, what's stopping like a backup from doing that? Going to Vegas? Yeah, I think the Leafs just sent him down. <laughs> <laughs> Bumsies! That's harsh. <laughs> He's trying his best. Well, he did try his best. He did. Hachi. And at the the funny thing was toward the end before before they picked up Campbell, they, they were kind of he was playing much better. But yeah, they couldn't keep keep it going with that guy. Might not be able to keep it going with anyone. It's fun, though. Hockey's fun right now. Every night, there's games that mean something. I love it. It's so much fun. It's so much better than basketball with their four teams. Well, in the East. Yeah, four teams in each conference that can actually win anything. Because I love watching Oklahoma City. So many games. They're a fun team. But you know that if they run into any team above them, they're dead. Yeah, there's, they've got no real chance at it. Whereas hockey, like... Well, look at St. Louis last year. So much fun. Yeah, they're getting the skids a little bit, but they could come back. Did you guys ever um, call, like, uh, I, I guess they'd be called greasers back in the 50s. We'd call them skidders. Like the guys like, hey. Yeah, like the... Like, the, <laughs> like a skid. Uh, like, like, gre- in like the movie Grease? Yeah, like, yeah. hey, look at that skitter. Like the T-Birds? Yeah. Still a lot of skidders in my hometown. <laughs> See, skids, I w- we'd call skids or burnouts. Just, yeah? yeah? Both, yeah. Yeah, it's like burnouts. <laughs> what a skidder. Uh, head, you know, we call head bangers. Heads, you know, heads. It was the preps against the heads early on in my school. It was preppy kids. What side were you on? I was a head banger all the way. <laughs> No, my class, it was very much like a Ferris Bueller situation. The heads and preps, they all got along great. I don't know why we all got along so well. well you're, you were on an island out there in the uh, prairies. But usually those two groups, like I remember when I was in junior high, man, the headbangers and the preppies, they would fight at every part. You'd go to parties in junior high because there was nothing else to do, bush parties. You'd get out there and there'd be like two guys just throwing down. Everyone would be standing around and smoking section, smoking section full of heads, no preps, but no fights going on there. No, none, none in school, maybe after school once in a while, but mostly at parties. It was mostly at parties that there were fights. The only people who fought in school were girls and there were a lot of girl fights. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. Lots of girl fights because they weren't liking it organizing the party. They just get it done after school. They're more efficient than we are. I witnessed one. um, It was after school when I went to St. John's in Peterborough, which was behind the uh, Memorial Center. And we were walking uh, to a buddy's house or something, and two groups came along, and the two guys just started throwing them. Some person stopped their car while driving by some adult and just said, stop it! And everyone just stopped. Everyone just went their own way. Hmm. That never happened in Athabasca. (laughs) (laughs) 
I would be curious to try that though. Like if you were, if you were at a bar downtown Toronto and <laughs> two guys are going at it and just walk up, just stop it. <laughs> See if they stop. They probably would. Cause they'd be like, what, what the hell? What's happening here? Um, hey, stuff. Yeah. Brian Hayes house. Okay. So far, I haven't heard of any new problems, and the Jiffy people are on it, so I assume he's fine. They had to be a thrilled last week with that uh, cross-promotion. Oh, uh, Jiffy, the, app, you mean? the Jiffy oh, app. Oh, the Jiffy app. Absolutely. They had to love that. I need the Jiffy app people. Jiffy app. Give Jiff- me the Jiffy app. I need the Jiffy app people to come to my house because my, uh, my eavesdrops are leaking, and it's causing a skating rink on the, on the porch. All right, very quickly, Dan, can I give a shout-out to Ty Lemon, stand-up comic? Yep. Uh, Ty Lemon is a big fan of our show. He sent out a tweet. His uh, Twitter handle is at Tux Lemons. I don't get that. But anyway, here's the tweet. Ready for it? Yep. Our beer league hockey team plays against the Phantoms four times every season. As the name suggests, the Phantoms aren't real. Every player simply meets at the bar drinks for three hours, and then returns home to their family, proudly informing them they scored the game-winning goal. (laughs) Brilliant. Nice work, Ty. Better go, Ty. He said, you know, the Phantoms. It's brilliant. It's brilliant, Ty. One of the good ones. Thanks for listening, Ty. We appreciate it. Um... Are we waiting on our guest? Is yeah. it our guest showing up or are we calling them? No, we're calling our guest. Uh, so just a quick backstory before you call stuff. So, yeah, we're getting up to the Trade trade Center. Trade deadline day. 24th of Feb. That's next Monday. Yep, we'll be here all day. We'll be here all day breaking it down in a comedic way. But uh, I am getting a little worried about Duffy because guys are jumping off the trade bait board left and right here. Yeah, another one jumped off uh, Monday night. Darren Dreger broke it? Darren Dreger broke it uh, from, and if you follow Gord Miller on Twitter, I don't, but if you do, you will be able to see Dregs as he breaks the trade. He and Gord were having a glass of wine in Ottawa, maybe some dinner. It looked like uh, Dregs was uh, diving into a steak, which I'll be doing Friday night before and after the Oval. Perfect. I love that. And, um, yeah, so Dregs broke it. It's uh, Tyler Toffoli to the Canucks. And, obviously, lots of teams. He was number two on our trade bait board, I think. They, after, no. No, he was down further. He Wasn't he six or something? I thought he was top five. Um, the Canucks have been hovering around the top of the Pacific. They aren't in first anymore, but... As uh, Jeff O'Neill, our good friend, um, one of the hosts on Overdrive on TSN 1050 Radio uh, in Toronto, he said, before this deal even happened, he said last week, he said, why don't the Canucks do something? Why not? They're there. I think they were right. They, yeah. they were in the conversation. He says, why not? Why not this year? Calgary apparently was very interested in Toffoli, they, that he's exactly what they needed. Um, but the Canucks... Uh, Apparently gave up uh, a prospect. We're going to ask Bob McKenzie about it. Bob's going to be our guest. He's gonna, we're going to call him. Let's call him. Let's give him a shout. And the Canucks right now have one of the hottest goalies in the NHL and Jacob Markstrom. He's been standing on his head. What did he have? A, a 45 save shutout the other night on Thursday night? That was the late game that... Uh, As uh, Ray Ferraro said, he's uh, playing his way into the Vesna conversation. Yep. And Quinn Hughes? Mm-hmm. He's making my early... Uh, Kale McCarr Calder call. I already gave McCarr the Calder in October. Quinn's making me look bad. He's yeah, like, he Hughes looks very good. Took over the rookie points lead, I believe, last week. Not sure if he still has it. I probably They've been it. trading it back and forth, him and McCarr. A couple of defensemen. How about that? Yeah, very cool. Um, oh, I was going to say something. I forget what it was. Are we going to have um, Bobby? Blake Coleman. Bobby on his magic line. Oh, oh, the magic line. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Because it's so crystal clear. Way better than any phone we've ever used. Did you see last week Pierre Lebrun signed a uh, multi-year extension with TSN? That's it, right. I always wonder if, if uh, Bobby is the one, if Bobby's the one who truly negotiates those deals. Oh, for sure. On Pierre and Dreg's behalf. And you wonder if Bobby, maybe, when it comes time for us to renegotiate, I think our deal is up in two and a half years. Maybe Bobby will step in for us. Bobby, what do you think? 
Absolutely. Agent business. Got to get into it. Yeah, that's where the real money is. Bobby, did that, ever, did that ever interest you? Did you ever say, maybe I could be a player agent? Did you ever think of that? No. No? It's too much Too much work. Yeah. It's a service industry. I'm not very good in the service industry. It's true, right? Because you're constantly oh, at their beck and time. call. Yeah, full yeah. time, man. Yeah, and almost like a people. right. You're a psychologist in a lot of ways. You're you're dealing with the ups, the downs. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes it's a babysitting job, and sometimes it's very gratifying. And you know, and some of those agents and their clients are like family. But it's uh, it's a fascinating world. And uh, hey, listen, I love agents. Uh, great contacts and. And amongst all the hockey people that are out there, managers, coaches, and everybody, and all that sort of stuff. But uh, I don't think. Uh, plus, my I'm not a very good negotiator, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but Bobby, when you describe the Sorry. role, the role of an agent, you just describe your role here at TSN. Essentially, you have to babysit people. You have to deal with the highs and the lows. No, it's it, well. There's highs and lows, but you, you don't have to babysit anybody. I'm kind of a we're part of a team, but everybody's kind of their own individual. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I, I was the editor-in-chief of the Hockey News for nine years. So 1982 to 1991. Um, I left the Hockey News in 1991 and turned it over to the the infamous TSN Quizmaster. Yes. Then became editor-in-chief of the Hockey News. And the reason, the prim- there, there were two primary, two primary reasons why. I ceased to be the editor-in-chief of the Hockey News. One, as an editor-in-chief, you're a manager. You, I manage multiple publications. I have staff. And, and when you're a manager, you're, you, know, you spend more time doing business than doing, quote-unquote, covering hockey, so to speak. And I realized I was getting further and further away from what I really set out to do in life, which was to be a hockey writer. So I thought, if I leave the Hockey News and go to the Toronto Stars, their hockey columnist, I'm going to go from from being uh, a manager to being a player. And a player gets up in the morning and basically says, yeah, I'm part of a team, but i got to take care of my business. And that's what I did when I was a hockey columnist. And, and, I, and ever since then, that's what I've kind of done. Bobby, so when you were at the Hockey News and when the Quizmaster was at the Hockey News, that was the heyday of the hockey. That was the Internet for hockey fans then. Yeah, it was because there was no Internet. That's how old I am. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I hired the quizmaster on a good on a Easter weekend in I want to say 1985, maybe. Do you ever regret it, Bobby? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I said after a while, I realized he realized how the arrangement would work, and it, the way it morphed into. And I think I basically told him this one day. I said, "Okay, here's how we're going to do this." You're going to do all the work, and I'm going to take all the credit. <laughs> that's how and, Dan's and, in my relationship. <laughs> and to this day, that's how we operate at TSN as well. <laughs> well, speaking of babysitting, Bob, but you may have to babysit Duffy or, or talk him off the ledge. Because oh, my if, God. Because if guys keep getting yeah. traded at this rate, uh, it's going to be a long Monday, the 24th. It's not promising at all. Another one, off the, another one bites the dust. So, so we've, you know, Jason Zucker has gone. Yeah. Tyler Toffoli's now gone. I mean, Duffy's going to be freaking out and all those other people that actually have to fill the time as opposed to myself and Dregs and Pierre and Gord Miller and Frank Cervelli. And we just sit at that back desk and guffaw. I mean, it's going to be, we're going to have to get the llamas back I think, to <laughs> no, race. No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to Foley, let's talk about that. That's the deal that uh, just went down as of uh, yeah. our podcast taping. So you guys talked about it a lot on Insider Trading. Man, there were a ton of teams interested in him, including other Pacific Division teams. Why was Vancouver the team that was able to get Tyler to Foley? Well, I think... Jim Betting is a general manager who really wants to improve his team and he wants to try and win the Pacific Division um, on, and make the playoffs. Because the funny thing about the Pacific Division is anytime you look at it, um, there's like five points separating, four or five points separating the top five teams. So, you know, for the longest time, Vancouver was in first place. I haven't checked today and looked at the standings, but I think it's Edmonton now. Um, 
you know, so you got Edmonton, you got Vancouver, you got Calgary, you got Vegas, you got Arizona, and you know, three of them are in the division playoffs on any given day, and two of them are in the wild card or being threatened to, to be taken out of the wild card spot by any of Winnipeg or uh, Nashville, who's got all sorts of games in hand, and and that. So, I think what it really boiled down to is that uh, Jim Benning's a highly motivated buyer who wanted to add to his the offensive depth of his team. He wants to make sure that they make the playoffs, A, and wants to give his team every opportunity to try and win the division. Um, if not win the division, then finish in one of the three divisional spots so that you're not a wild card team. And then he wants to try to make as much noise as he can in the playoffs. And um, no second-round pick and um, prospect Tyler Madden Tyler Madden's a, a, a real good B plus trending up prospect, even though he was a third round pick to uh, to Vancouver. Um, you know he's playing has played this season more like a second round pick or a, a borderline first round pick. Now he's injured. He's up the next four to six weeks with a broken finger that happened, I think, on Friday or Saturday night this past weekend. Um, but he's a real good prospect, and the LA Kings are really excited to get him and a second round pick. They had to take Tim Schaller's contract to make the money work, and uh, they've got to protect it if Tafoli resigns in Vancouver. There's a fourth round pick to resign him. Uh, if Vancouver does resign him, they've got to give LA a fourth round pick in 2022. So um, yeah, LA gets younger, and Vancouver adds an NHL, you know, top six forward when he's on his game to help uh, Pedersen and Besser and um, and Miller with the offense. Are the Canucks ahead of their own schedule? They have to be surprised at how well that things have gone. They've, they're getting great goaltending. They're getting scoring, uh, great defense. Um, do you think they're surprised by themselves? Uh, maybe a little bit, but I think, you know, if you look at what they've done in the off season, um, past couple of off seasons, you know, they went out and they signed Tyler Myers to a big free agent contract on defense. Um, the year before that, they went out and really loaded up on bottom half of the roster guys like Antoine Roussel and, and Jay Beagle and, uh, and Schaller, who's now obviously moved. But, um, you know, they've, they've been angling for this. They, they, they've got an owner in Francesco Aquilini whose patience for a rebuild is what I would generously describe as severely limited. Just ask and, Trevor Linden, right? Well, exactly. And and I think in Vancouver, you know, they're on an, an accelerated rebuild. And when they when they were able to get Besser, Pedersen, and Hughes, the three cornerstone pieces of the rebuild, um, they're they're trying to move this along. And obviously, the JT Miller trade at the draft, you know, giving up their first round pick, and uh, and so. Yeah, it's it's pretty apparent. And I was on Vancouver radio like a month or two ago, and they asked me how busy did I think Jim Benning would be at the deadline. And I said, I got to believe that, you know, not crazy all in, but, you know, committed, significantly committed. Because you don't make all those moves, sign Myers and trade for Miller and, and you know, get the depth guys that you got and, and make all those moves for the here and now if you're not trying to make the playoffs and trying to make some noise. But at the same time, and, you make those moves, but everything has to fall in place. Like oh, JT Miller great. has to have a career year. You have to have Jacob Markstrom standing on his head. You have to have Thatcher Demko yeah. winning games for you. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's like a tightrope that you walk because that, that swing between really good and really, you know, that swing between Nirvana, which would be winning the division and getting into the playoffs and, Missing, you know, missing out on a wild card spot by one point, and on any given day, I'm, you know, like I said, it's, you know, it's, it's five six points separating those two extremes. Mm-hmm. So, the, you know, the margins are really, really, really tight. It's a it's a dangerous game, but I mean, being a general manager in the National Hockey League is not for the faint of heart. And Jim Benning knows he's in a market with an owner that, as I said. Um, would not appear to be um, looking for a long, slow, painful rebuild. And, in fact, wants this thing accelerated as quickly as possible. 
you brought up the JT Miller trade, or maybe we did, and that first rounder from that trade got moved over the weekend to New Jersey from Tampa for Blake Coleman, along with a really good World Junior, Canadian World Junior, Adam Foote's son, Nolan. So high prices being paid, Bob, for a lot of these guys. Now I know he's got term and he's got a he's got a good contract, but then you look at Jimmy Rutherford in Pittsburgh. He gave a lot to Bill Guerin for Zucker. Is that a trend maybe we're going to see over the next week or so leading up to the deadline? Maybe higher prices paid for some of these guys? It would appear to be so. Now, the, I will, the, the distinction, when, when Jimmy Rutherford gave up his first-round pick and prospect Kalen Addison, the defenseman who played for Team Canada at the World Junior Championship, he was receiving in return a top-six scoring winger who has three years left on his contract after this year. So that's a really important distinction. So they, they've got, you know... Yeah, Jimmy gave up his first-round pick and a good, pro, real good prospect on the blue line, but he's he's got three, he's got four playoff runs of Jason Zucker if it if it goes that far in terms of his contract. That's notable. Um, you know, the Vancouver Canucks gave up a second-round pick and 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 Tyler Madden for Tyler Toffoli, and his contract expires. He's a pure rental. He's just a rental. Um, same thing with. Blake Coleman in Florida, in uh, Tampa, he's got a year left on his deal after this year at $1.8 million, which is a really a favorable bargain. cap hit for a guy who scored 21 goals, is probably on pace for 30, and is a great defensive player and plays really well as a penalty killer. So he's going to fit right in in Tampa, and Tampa's looking at it saying, not only have we added a, an NHL forward that's on pace for 25, 30 goals and can kill penalties, without giving up anything off our roster, that helps us in in this playoff run. But we've also got him next year. And we know next year, whether it's Yanni Gourd or Tyler Johnson or Alex Kalorn or Andre Palat, they're going to have to offload salary. And to have to be able to slot a guy at $1.8 million, like Coleman, who's got the ability to score 25 or 30 and be a good all-around player, that allows them to do that. And on top of all that, Julian Brisbane in Tampa has got to sign Sergachev, a top four defenseman, to a new contract. He's coming off his bridge deal. Um, Anthony Sorelli, who's emerging as you know a, a super all-around player that some people are wondering maybe maybe he's a young Patrice Bergeron. We will see. Wow. Um, you know you've got Mitchell Stevens, you've got Eric Chernak, all these young guys coming out of entry level. Tampa's got to sign them all. So. To have cheap labor that's as talented as Coleman is gives them a huge advantage in terms of how they can manipulate the cap for next year. But, but the prices are high, and, and, and to your point. And where I would say this is really illustrated is when the New, York, New Jersey Devils traded their captain Andy Green on the weekend to the Islanders for a second-round uh, sorry a second-round pick. And prospect, I believe it was David Quimble. I get my Quimbles mixed up because there's David and there's John, and and then of course there's Joel. I think you're right. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. But I'm pretty sure it's David. Yeah. Anyways, um, but a second round pick and a prospect, albeit not a you know not a high end prospect, but for and, and listen, I got no problem with Andy Green, and he'll really help the Islanders. But you know, this is a player. Who, uh, get the research department to look it up, but I think he's. 36, 37 years old. Yeah, I can't believe and, how long he's been in New Jersey. It's I know. crazy. It's been, you know, he's, and, and Lou, Lou Emerald knows him inside out, obviously, because Lou was there when he got him in Jersey. Yeah. So anyways, the point I'm making is that for, for a mid to late 30s defenseman like Andy Green on an expiring contract, getting a second round pick and, and a fair to middle and prospect is really good. And for the, for the LA Kings to get a second round pick and a quite a good prospect in Tyler Madden. That's a really good return for Tyler Toffoli. So I can't even imagine what Chris Kreider is going to bring. Oh, man. And we'll see where it goes from there. So, Bobby, the St. Louis Blues run last year, has it yes. changed uh, I said changed it. Has it changed oh, the... One way to pronounce it. <laughs> has it changed everyone's deadline approach from here to the end of time? Because before, it would be why would we just squeak into the playoffs and give up all that uh, that talent and know that we're going to get knocked out in the first round when everyone says, like, hey, anyone can win it now? We always think that. I mean, Julian Brisbois, right after, like, in the, in the new year, 
he did some media interviews and they asked him about getting rentals. And he goes, I've done a study for the last 10 years. And he, he, he was quoted as talking about all the teams that gave up like first round picks and second round picks for this rental and that rental and the number of them that were not successful, that didn't make the playoffs or got knocked out in the first round or got knocked out in the second round. And he started looking at the teams that actually won. And he, so he's looking at the, um, you know, the Washington Capitals. The year the Washington Capitals won, their big rental was, a, I think it was a third-round pick for Michael Kempty. Uh, and it turned out to be a huge ad. And, and Kempty was marvelous in that run, run to the Cup. And, um, and, and same thing where, you know, St. Louis didn't go crazy with, um, with rental prices last year. Now, Boston, on the other hand, they, they did pay a, a price. They did a hockey deal for Charlie Coyle, and they did a rental deal for Marcus Johansson. Almost paid off. I mean, they lost in Game Seven of the Cup Final. But the point being is that Julian Brisbois was saying, you know, history would suggest that if you spend first-round picks on rentals, you're more than likely going to be disappointed. And so what you what we've seen here is teams looking for that player that's got a year left on his deal, like right. Mike Coleman in in Tampa, but. Some of these teams have no choice. You start to get down to the nitty-gritty here. What's Boston going to do? You know, if the, if the music stops and Boston doesn't get themselves a second-line winger to play with Krejci and DeBrusque, then it will have been considered something of a failure at the deadline. So, you know, do they ante up for, for Chris Kreider? And the Rangers are absolutely convinced that if they trade Kreider, they're going to get at least what they got last year for Kevin Hayes, which was a first-round pick from the Winnipeg Jets and Brendan Lemieux, who's now a young player in the Ranger lineup. So, you know, on one hand, you've got all sorts of evidence that suggests the market's going to cool on the rentals, and what we're seeing here right now is that it's still pretty warm to hot for guys like Toffoli and uh, and some of the, and Andy Green and what have you. Well, let's hope so, Bob, because we've got a long show on Monday. <laughs> and... <laughs> I want you guys to have something to talk about. What stick have you guys got going this year? Oh, lots of stuff well, Bob, in, the, in the hopper. We will be there for you when you need us, and there's you need some time. Oh, kill. I, I don't need you. Okay, you don't, but if Duffy James does. does. James, James, James needs you badly. <laughs> Bob, uh, you're awesome to come on with us. I hope you have a great rest of the evening, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you on Trade Center on the 24th. Awesome, boys. Sounds good. Thanks, Bobby. That's... Uh, the legend that is Bob McKenzie. That was fun. What's what's his Twitter follower count up to? I haven't checked that. Oh, in. God. Great question. It's over a okay. mil- million one. Let's get a guess in there. Million Stop. one, I'll say. I'm going to say a million four. 1.35. Do you know for sure or you're guessing? No, I'm guessing. That was a guess. 1.6. Holy Like man. I said. 1.6. He's like Selena Gomez. Selena probably has 600,000. Hey. Bob McKenzie has a million more Twitter followers than Selena Gomez. Bobby's following me. Oh, sorry. There's, there's oh, some slot in there. <laughs> there's some bug, bug action going on in there. Boy, every show you've got something happening in that body. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, hey there. Flashbacks. Hey now. Well, that was fun. Uh, next week, we'll recap our uh, our fun times at the Theo Vaughn Show. Steak dinner before. Theo Vaughn. Steak dinner after. Tools the acid reflux. Steak in a Big Mac. Ooh, how about a steak? You know you have uh, steak and eggs for breakfast. Yep. How about a steak McMuffin? Ooh. Right? Bingo. Steak McMuffin. McDonald's. You're welcome. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. <laughs> How about, you know, have the, the shamrock shake, steak shake. Okay, uh, we'll see you next week. See you next week. <laughs>